Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Adobe Live. My name is Molly Hetty Carroll, and this is the third and final session of Bring Your Own Hero, a comic, uh, a comic masterclass with comic artist, storyboard artist, and educator, Klaus Sherwinski. Klaus, are you looking forward to the session today? I'm bursting at the seams with excitement. I have so much material. I have far too much material. I had to drop a couple of things that I wanted to do last session or the session before pushing it into this session. Let's see what falls over the over the off the table at the end of this session. It's going to be nuts. I'm going to have uh, giant monsters, giant robots, tiny robots, um, death and destruction, uh, samurais and uh, and Spider-Man. So so it's just going to be amazing. That's fantastic. And hello to everybody tune, who's tuned in and hello everybody in the chat. I see some familiar names from yesterday. Hi, Jane. Hi, Sandrina. Hi, Bernard. Hi, Doris. Uh, hello, Dennis. And of course, if you would like to join the fun and uh, participate in the chat and maybe ask Klaus a couple of questions, you can head over to behance.net slash Adobe Live. So Klaus, um, I think we can get started. What do you have planned for today except for robots and giant monsters and everything cool in the world? I have I have planned to give some feedback. So there were some amazing people who gave me some of their art, including you, Molly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'll give some feedback, right? So I'm going to point out some quote unquote errors. I mean, we are it's art, right? So you can do whatever you want. But there's some things that work better for the audience out there, for the average American comic book reading audience. Uh, and some things that work don't, don't work so well. Um, so when I point a finger at somebody going like, hey, you should change this, there are always three fingers pointing back at me because this is all stuff that I um, I struggled with when I started out drawing comics, right? I didn't come out of the womb and was like, hey, I can draw like this. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I feel your pain, whoever's out there. And I'm so thankful for the trust that people give me when they give me their artwork to critique, which is like one of the biggest compliments I can get that somebody trusts me with their art and and tries uh, and and allows me to try and give critique and show pointers like how things can be done differently and uh, I'm never critiquing style um, except when it comes to my own I'm the worst critic of my own and I'm punishing myself for everything like in session number one I said uh, I think I said something about aspect ratio when I'm at shot size like all these technical terms are really important to me so uh, I'm always whipping myself first. So let's dive right into Photoshop and look at what we what we did yesterday. Um, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes. Ah, okay. I don't uh, I don't know what we're looking at right now from the from the chat for some reason from this thing, but it's fine. We see Photoshop, so we see the page from yesterday that we started. So for everybody who missed out yesterday's session, it's still on YouTube and Behance. You can check it out. We used uh, we had a little sample script there or a script. Script. I, I missed out the I, and also I didn't uh, didn't add an O to too late down here. So I'm definitely not a writer. But Shakespeare said brevity is the soul of wit, and I just you know shrunk the script by two letters. That's really efficient, I think. Yeah, it's um, comics. You know, there's deadlines. It has to be fast. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, making mistakes is super normal, and changing. Uh, changing your, your your style, changing your idea about storytelling over time, changing uh, uh, actually um, panel sizes and 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 shots and how we frame it while we're developing the comic that is super normal. Uh, don't uh, don't be afraid to kill your darlings and uh, and just change stuff if it doesn't work or if you find a better solution or if a friend gives you a better solution. It takes a village to make a good to make a good picture. And, uh, and we should take all the feedback that is available and then judge it on our own terms, whether we want to um, go with it or not. So this is our sample script. It's very simple. We have an establishing shot of a location. And this is how I started out, if you remember yesterday. I had six panels, so I just broke it down into six evenly shaped panels, same size, everything. It's a square. It's very boring, very static. But it's a very valid way, actually, of creating a comic book page. I would say this is basically for six panels. This might be a standard to start out. And then you should have arguments and you can argue with yourself and negotiate just like I did yesterday. Like, 
Why should this panel be bigger? Why can this panel be shorter? What is the natural panel form of this and that? When do I actually need it? And when can I skew the perspective and play with it a little bit and uh, zoom in as close as possible and as far away as necessary? Because that's what I'm always trying to do in comic books, at least. Um, so it's simple. Uh, graveyard, Spider-Man arrives. Graveyard is empty. Spider-Man turns around. Ooh, who's there? Uh, vampire. It's indeed Dracula. Tomb of Dracula was a was a Marvel comic series. So we're staying within the Marvel realm with the vampire attacking with bats, and then Spider-Man shoots webbing at the webs. And we have it in here, but there's a, a couple things that I didn't like. For example, this Spider-Man has like uh, shoots the webbing and the the webs are uh, going around the, the bats attacking him, but it's all at the same spot. This is, this is not very good. And we can see from this, the shape, how I arranged it, that it would be nice if the bats were more on the right, not really above him, but on the right. So we needed actually a page with panel, which I decided to do then in the next step. So I brought it to the next step, which was this. So we go from first pass to second pass and we see dramatic changes. This is the moment when all the key storytelling is already done. It's, the rest is execution. The rest is quality. However, this step is a mentally very challenging step. And while I can make it in one hour, you might need five or six hours or you know, put it aside for a day and look at it again on the next day with fresh eyes and um, and take it from, from something simple to something, something more complex and something more better working. Um, and keeping this mentality of being fresh, that's a very good, that's a very good tip, I think. Um, so we decided to make the, the splash panel, not the splash panel, but the money shot. We wanna make it the, uh, the scene when the vampire is attacking because we wanna see the vampire guy and the bats really big, really close, really shocking. And we don't need a lot of, uh, uh, establishing shot from the church. Um, uh, this can be done more efficiently. And we, we pulled out every trick in the book in order to cut away, in order to gain a couple quarter inches of space, in order to make it really better to go a bit closer to not waste any space because we don't have space and we don't have time in animation and we don't have space in, in comic books. So this is really cool. Um, and then I, I tried to plus this, I, I, I made it better. And this is where we got yesterday. So we see a huge change already here in quality, just by me doubling the time, going from half an hour, 45 minutes to a full hour and adding 50 more minutes into these three frames, just made it immensely better. You can see how the Spider-Man really has anatomy now, even though I maintained the, ac the, the abstract shapes and the, the dynamic action forms of him, and um, yeah, I just I just up the the realism. I introduced shading. I introduced some detail, but not too much. And you always have to be aware of where the detail goes. And uh, yeah, and this reads much better. And then yesterday I, I sat down. I was like, no, I I still need to finish this page. So I show you like what the real breakdowns should look like. So I invested much more time. I invented invested another one and a half hours, another 90 minutes full masterclass size basically into this page. And this is what I came up with. It's exciting for everybody. This is our work. Ta -da! <laughs> it was yeah. a mistake. Um, and it, it only came from the writers, from the people with the ideas, uh, people uh, who brought in the vampire and the bats and the creative solutions here. Uh, Graveyard is indeed an, an, an awesome, an awesome thing to, to look at. Let, let me let me uh, for a second hide the other stuff that is down here. So, so this took two and a half hours in total from this from the sketching in class in the presentation to you going away and working this. Yeah, that's two and a half three hours. Yeah, yeah. round about it. Yeah, that's in total. that's unbelievably quick. Like for the for this quality, it's extremely fast. Thank you very much. It's it's I would say it's standard fast. There are other people that I look up to, Hai Ingo Rümling, uh, that are really fast, like amazing artists who just like put down a rough sketch and then what they do, the lines are all perfect and the anatomy and the drapery and, and everything happens. I need another uh, I need another few hours actually to ink this right to take it over and uh, um, take it into Photoshop on another layer and just make it really clean line art. For me, however, um, it's all about the storytelling that is of interest here in this in this masterclass series. It's not about rendering and the line work. It's about um, 
to where do you choose where the blacks go? Where do you choose where uh, how much we see of a character? What angle do you choose? Do we do a Dutch angle like up here? Uh, do we do an extreme close up like here? Uh, here's another Dutch angle. Comic books are full of those Dutch angles because we can make it more exciting this way, have the camera move basically. We have to super exaggerate in, in animation, in, uh, in film for storyboarding, this doesn't work. If, if you tilt it all the time, people will get seasick while watching that. So um, that, is, that is to be avoided in film. But we're in comics, so let me continue here. So um, yeah, up the quality on, on this stuff here. I drew some bets and I wanted to actually use a Photoshop a brush. There's a bet brush. I think it's one of Carl Webster's, but I'm not sure. Um, so there are a lot of uh, cool brushes you can use for this that has a scaling effect in there with the, with the brush intensity on your, on your tablet. Um, but this is stuff I just drew in and we wanted to have uh, the, the birds, sorry, not the birds, because um, actually bats are not birds, they're mammals. So am, am, I, am I right? I think I'm right on this one. All right. Yes. So, so I wanted them to go from big to medium to tiny, right? And so it, it, there's an arc that is formed in there and it's enhanced by this guy, right? He's commanding them, he's jumping off, he's flying, his cloak is flying away up in the air in this moment. And we would later on the next page, we'll see how the clothes, like, cloak goes down. But if you, if you, if you make the, the cloak actually be down like this, for example, that wouldn't look very dynamic. It still works right here, but there's too much symmetry. And, and we should always try to go over the top when we draw characters in action. That means that you make a character, whatever you invest into the character, drawing a muscular character, drawing a dynamic character, always make it 150%. If you make it 150% intensity, 70% of that will read. Half of it will read. So if you only draw 100% like a dynamic character, that's not dynamic enough. This will read as a guy like struggling or dancing or doing something. This is a dynamic character. This is comic books. Comic books is over the top. This is how we get our audience. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any questions in the chat regarding this page. Well, there's, this an, there's, we a, an awful, there's an awful lot of compliments. A really stunning composition. This is great, looks stunning very quick and wonderful, very nice. Oh, look at that. So I think you've, uh, I think you've impressed the audience, Klaus. Wonderful. wonderful. According to the audience, it looks great. Okay, well then, then they're right. If the client likes it, the client is absolutely right. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's, let's not waste too much time on this and, uh, and go into, into some other cool stuff um, if there are no questions. And that's actually, uh, it's a, a friend, an, animation, an animator from South Africa. I, I was recently at FMX Fair in Stuttgart uh, for Animation Festival, and I met an animator from, uh, from South Africa, Claire. And she told me, she's a producer, and uh, she told me, like, when there are no questions, that is the biggest compliment that you can get. When the client says, like, oh, yeah, I have no questions. Every, everything is there. Everything is explained in your animation. Everything is explained in your drawing. No questions. That's when you, when you, when you actually hit the jackpot. Um, talking about jackpots, here's a, here's a really cool project um, that I had the, the pleasure of, of giving some feedback on, and it's yours, Molly. Oh, yeah, um, I was going to say, that looks familiar. <laughs> like a familiar comic book page. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Molly is a jack of all trades. She does all sorts of things. She, she's an animator. She's a 2D artist, art director, has her own little game studio. And, and does her own little IP, like here's an animation uh, and you can follow her on Instagram for sure. Like me, you can find Molly Hattie Carroll uh, on Instagram. And you also have a website that has a lot of the art for the Zenny Beasts um, project. So maybe you can, you can tell us something about Zenny Beasts. Oh, sure, I, ha happily. And uh, for, for the record, this isn't me abusing my power. I didn't make Klaus do this. He did this, <laughs> he did this from himself. Uh, yeah, so Xenobeasts is a multimedia project and it's about giant monsters that represent social issues that are destroying this 90s Saturday morning cartoon city called Myopia. And um, it's multimedia, so there's a variety of different Xenobeast projects in the works. There's um, a board game, an animated series, a video game, and a comic book series. So we've got a lot of big plans for, for our big monsters. And uh, yeah, there's some animation visible here from uh, one of the games that's in development. There's also production artwork for the designs of the creatures because that's my 
primary focus is creature uh, creature design. And um, there is, for example, a board game that's going to be released in shops, um, hopefully this summer, called Xenobeasts Breaking News. That's probably the first piece of Xenobeasts media that's going to come out. Really cool. There's there's so much going on and so many channels. And you also do like complete illustrations like this piece, for example. Um, re really nice. Uh, I think we talked about this one as well. But I think we should we should dive into the comic book page because this is not about illustration. This is about comics. Um, but it all starts indeed with one image. And this is really cool. We see the professor here uh, fighting a giant alligator. Um, so yeah, there's some cool stuff. As I promised, we're going to look at cool stuff. Yeah, I'm glad my project is cool. <laughs> I think it's I think it qualifies as cool. There's there's a lot of story in there and a lot of interesting things. So, but it started this page this this uh we just saw it now in color in final, but it started with a really rough breakdown sketch and uh and some dialogue in there. I remember you showing this to me and I was like, "Wow, this this reads. This has fluidity. The story is funny, quirky characters um with their own idiosyncrasies and all that, despite the giant monsters who are indeed like the the real uh, heroes that we're bringing here. Um, but yeah, um, this was a great breakdown of the page. And um, I, uh, yeah, do you have anything to say with it? about this or should I, should I, I don't know what I want to um, say about it. Well, I'll say, I'll say for the record, the final artwork is done by a, a Japanese artist called Shinya Hashizume. is an extremely good artist. Um, and, uh, oh, there we go. This is, uh, yeah, you should all follow Shinya's uh, social media. He's, he's, he should have so many more followers. One of my goals at Xenobeast is I want him to be famous because he is so unbelievably good at, <laughs> at art and animation. So you should definitely check him out. And that initial um, scenario sketch, as I, as I call it, which is me writing the story while also uh, drawing out the pages, this took me uh, one hour. So this is what I'm capable of in one hour. As and a, this is fast. Uh, yeah, and that's and that's fast, exactly, as a non-comic book person. So <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, uh, I, I, I think you are also a comic book person. You wear so many hats. It's, the, the thing is like uh, breaking down a story in one hour is like, it's like no time. That's super fast. And it doesn't matter what style it is. It takes effort and it takes a lot of brain power to bring this on the page and to make it read. Um, we see you have, you have a very, um, um, a bit of a static um, composition here, right? Like long panel, short panel, long panel, short panel, then three short ones, but that's perfectly fine. This is not an action sequence. Uh, we, we don't have a shot in there that is like ginormously uh, wowing us with action, like an attack of a vampire with bats. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a shot in there that is a bit more dynamic and it's the last one on the page. Um, so um, we, um, we took this or Shinya took this to line art, this thing. And I think this is the moment when I, when I saw that and I was like, Hmm, this is really nice. Uh, the line work is really precise. It's, it's a little bit thin reading it from afar, like the Simpsons comics, for example, have a bit of thicker line work, but the difference to American style comics is that there's very little line weight variation going on in here. It's mostly uh, a nice outline because in animation, uh, you only have one outline, outline size, and you maintain that to have good continuity. Um, so, so this is nice. We see it works. There's enough space for the word balloons. The word balloons are placed in a good fashion. Everything works together. But to my eyes, as an American style comic uh, comic artist, um, and that is a very specific area of comic books, it it read a little bit not dynamic enough, let's put it that way. There was there was stuff in there um, where, let me let me see in there, I'm going in pink. There's there's areas like this that are just empty. And, and I see like he's like squeezed into the corner a little bit here. Um, there's also like a lot of empty space here. I'm like, why aren't we closer on this, right? Like what we actually only need is basically this. We don't need more than that. So if we were move the word balloon to him here and move this a little bit to the side, boom, 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 we have we have a better framing of this. So I went into this and did a did a sketch over, which I love doing. And and this is the sketch over here. So let me let me shorten this a little bit so we focus on one tier after the next and give this give this a moment of our time. Boom. So let me see before and after. 
you notice how um, I vary the, the sizes a little bit more on this page. There's one big one, and the other ones are like evenly split mostly, and then we have the action shot down there. So um, I, I just move in much closer to these two characters. Um, and we have the same storytelling. We have the same lettering, the same, uh, all the, all of this, right? I cut off the, the, the legs because we don't really need to see, see the legs. Like, are we, are we interested in the floor? Are we interested in his legs? No, we are not. We don't need that. That's fine if we, if we don't show it. And we can show that he's in the bed. We know he's in the hospital bed. It reads very simply. Actually, we had a scene in my G.I. Joe comic with a hospital bed. So right. Bring yeah. him back again there. It's the same shape language. And it's, it's very easy for us to see where he is. We see the drip here. That's also happened in the other comic book. Um, and yeah, we, uh, I just drew over this. And I, I just uh, I didn't hit the style. I'm not like that. I'm not an animator that really needs to nail the style and proportion perfectly. I do it in my own style. It's, it's the way of storyboarding I do. I think that emphasizes, though, how how it's not about style. It's about layout and consideration of, of uh, going in as uh, as close as possible, as far away as necessary, and balancing all of the bubbles and everything like that. It doesn't matter what style you're drawing in. You can draw in Peppa Pig style. It doesn't matter. It's the principles of the composition that really matter in every single panel for the comic. Yeah, it can be something like... Pepper Pig, like this is very abstract children's books illustration style, um, or, or this style um, from this comic book. You showed it to me once. Uh, it's like a children's book, oh, but it's for. Yes, I, I was hoping to bring up this comic, Cat Kid Comic Club, which, by the way, I am not kidding, is one of the best books about making comics and being an artist in general. It has so much heart. It gives actual advice for how to be creative, how to deal with things like artist block or not feeling good enough. Like actually legitimately, you need to get uh, Understanding Comics with Scott McCloud. You have to get Will Eisner's Comics and Sequential Art and get this book as well. It's really great. And yeah, like you said, the style, a lot of it intentionally looks like a kid drew it, but the storytelling is so good. I mean, also the, you know, the layouts are, also very primitive and stuff but the story is so good and the message it's conveying is so great um yeah i can only recommend it uh, you brought me on to it uh, thanks for for having it there i forgot the the exact name um yeah it's it's very uh it's very simplistic or it's very simple and simple is good because it means we can't we we don't lose our audience and this is what we want to do um and it's also very inspiring to the next generation. So if you're a bit older, if you're an experienced Photoshop user, give this to your kids or, or your nephews or whoever, you know, who are young, uh, inspire them to, to drawing. Um, and this is what I'm doing with, uh, hopefully doing with this masterclass. I'm hoping I don't scare anyone um, because my main message, if you didn't read it, is drawing comic books is hard. It's difficult. It takes a long time to, to learn it. It takes an even longer time to master it. Um, and I'm still working on on the letter, so um, yeah, we see here how much how much room there is that is not used for anything, and 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 we, we show like pants here and stuff like this is this is nice, it's nicely drawn, nicely composed figures, um, but um, yeah, they they don't have the impact, and we're going here from a from a from a from a close up low angle basically to a high angle shot medium shot then we go to a medium shot with a, with a rise line in the middle then we go to a close up shot and then we we go to the other ones again so um i always try to maintain as much of the original intent of the artist in there because i don't want to cramp their style and and the the original artist always does the heavy lifting it's not me doing the overpaint but you can see here how the doctor and and the patient overlap much more like there's a lot of distance here and we don't need that distance we can just make them overlap more save time and then have more room these two here do a little aside basically in shakespearean terms like hey wait what happened to the first interns well let's, well don't ask me about that um so that's that's funny and and that's really nice how how uh how we can we can take it uh, a little bit further this is just great here uh molly is playing with word balloons i might come to work balloons and layout and typography at the end of this last session if we still have time um but we talked about it yesterday about um, pointers 
and these connectors, right? So basically, um, he's talking here. The assistant is talking how his name, this professor's name is also Shinya, right? Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a, story, there's a story behind that. The, art, the artist who drew this, uh, Shinya Hashizume, um, is uh, is he is a big kaiju fan, and he his graduation film from Tama Art University is uh, Kaiju Bath, which you should check out on YouTube. It's and it, it's um, the detail is just unbelievable in this in this animation. So he's a kaiju expert, and um, I visited him in Tokyo uh, and met him, and he told me a bunch of tricks and tips about how to how to frame kaiju, how to design kaiju. So he's a kaiju expert. So we named our kaiju expert after him, and then coincidentally, he we asked him to also make this comic that highlights the character he's named after. Though our Shinya is kind of a jerk, and the real Shinya is the loveliest person ever. Yeah, and it's I mean like this professor Shinya here is also uh, yeah he's kind of crazy character, and you you will you will like it when you uh, if you ever grab uh, this comic book here of the red, or if you got the. Uh, Actually, Zenibi's profiles, where where Shinya is, Dr. Professor Shinya is featured for the first time. You will enjoy this. Uh, so yeah, um, really cool stuff that you had at a comic conference recently. You spoke at uh, art department uh, playgrounds, the art department in Eindhoven, and this comic book that I just had there was available in Eindhoven as well. Um, so that's really cool. Um, oh, you laughed. <laughs> no, it, it's it's true. It's really entertaining. I laughed out loud when I read it. And it's, yeah, giant monsters and human characters. So what I wanted to, to address here was the word balloons for one second, because you deal with it very creatively. So uh, in the scene before, Professor Shinya was like trapping a rat, basically, and he he jumped over it and he basically uh, put a put a, a lasso around the rat. Is that true? Yeah, an elephant-sized rat, to be clear. Yeah. Really yeah. big one. <laughs> Yeah, so that was pretty amazing, and like this, uh, this assistant here is totally fanboying out about Professor Shinya. That was amazing when you whooshed over and under, and then the wreck tried to kill us, but ouch! And then his his, uh, his dislocated uh, shoulder comes into effect again. But what's interesting here is how the work balloons are used. And they're actually creating a loop around him. It illustrates and helps push the narrative of how he is moving and he's he's waving around his arms, and, and the professor just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, I did all that. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, yeah, that's really cool technique of incorporating smart word balloons and, and lettering into your comic book. You can do this if you have enough experience about this. Um, and if you're daring, let's put it that way. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work so well. But here it works fantastically, I think. Um, let's see what else I changed. I think I changed the last shot the most. Like when uh, when this general person here is entering, wham, the door slams. That's good. Sound effects. Sound effects are nicely done. Um, brings cert certain type of flowers. That's nice, but it's not very dramatic. And look what I did with it. I, I chose an angle that was, this is almost low angle, but it's, it's, it's still very nicely visible, the horizon line in here. Um, so now the horizon line is like really outside, uh, outside the, the, the life area, outside the the panel. I even tilted the panel a little bit to have the content have an effect on the borders. And wow, he's he's hammering the door open, and uh, uh, yeah, and the panel even jolts a little bit. And and then there's shadow. Shadow is always amazing. If you use shadows for storytelling, you can you can just punch much more effect into your um, into your comics. You should use it only, however, when you really need it. So um, keep, keep, keep that in mind. I think I have a shadow somewhere here in the Spotlight Wheelie comic that I drew. On the cover, I used the shadow to, to good effect. It's not black. It's not solid black because I did it digitally, Photoshop. But yeah, this is the cover for Spotlight Wheelie. We might get to talk about it later on. It's a giant, small robot uh, fighting giant beasts on a planet. And yeah, here we have the shadow coming in from out of frame. So I'm thinking out of the frame and see what's how the world continues beyond it. And we have a high angle shot looking down. I mean, he's small, but he's fighting back. So yeah, with, with shadows, you can do a lot. Fantastic. Yeah, that last frame in particular, really mega, like night and day comparison. And uh, yeah, Shinya just took it to the next level, just cleaned everything up really nicely, just went with it. See how clean the lines are here. And uh, yeah, just this this works just nicely. He, uh, I don't know how the posing was before. The posing was a bit different. Yeah, he even copied my posing very good. 
So you as an art director uh, um, spearheaded this basically. You took my feedback, gave it to the artist. The artist followed up on it, again plussed it, again made it better, made it all tight. Um, so this is just good teamwork. And this is what American style comic books are all about. There's a writer, there's an artist, there's an art director, an editor, a lettering artist, uh, an embellisher, an inker. So um, we have all those disciplines. They all come together to make a comic book that you read in a couple minutes, but it will take us days and weeks to produce it. And then we added color or you added color, uh, your team added color. And it's, yeah, just came out great. Um, amazing scene, just gives it much more atmosphere. We now see, oh yeah, the, the, the doctor is actually dark haired than in India, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. in this one. Uh, so yeah, interesting international kaiju, which is giant monster story. And uh, yeah, not to be missed, uh, but I think the first thing out will be the game, right? I believe so, I yeah. It seems, to, it seems to be going in that direction. Very good, yeah. So um, I don't know. Are there any questions in the chat? Sorry, we, we're just interrupting each other now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's that's why there's a question. Firstly, I really appreciate the, the highlighting of Zenobis. Thank you for that. Um, Dennis has a question, which is, I always make too many steps to convey a story. Too little seems too fast to me. What is a good balance? And um, and for, exa for example, if you don't have dialogue, I think that's that's also a question I had with with the Spider-Man versus Dracula page that you made. Um, in that case, you were working from a script that was predetermined. But indeed, like, how does an artist decide um, how much story to convey on a page? That is really difficult. It takes an experienced writer, actually. Uh, it's a, it's a writing exercise. Um, determining how many panels go on a page and how much story goes in the page. If we look into Spotlight Wheelie, um, like the comic book that I drew, um, uh, that I, and I also co-wrote, I pitched it actually to the, the editor, uh, the chief editor of IDW Comics at the time. And there are some panels, there are some pages who have like, that have like 11 panels, right? There's a lot going on and we were really efficient in our use of, of space in this comic book. Um, I can I can come to that in a second, but I will push it to the end. We'll come back to the um, to this. But um, since we're talking about efficient use of time and how to bracket it and what moments to pick for your storytelling, I have the perfect example here. And it's, a, it's an example by an old friend of mine who I know for 20 years now. And um, yeah, as I said, biggest compliment is if somebody sends you a page and goes like, hey, Klaus, can you look over it? Can you can you make it better a little bit? Do you have ideas about this? Um, so this is really cool. Um, this is the page from, a, from a, a comic book called Steel Don't Die. When I say bring your own heroes, it can be a samurai cyborg. Um, so Steel Don't Die is really cool. Um, it's, it's a small comic book. Um, uh, I have the latest edition here from last year in Erlangen. There's actually a a tiny sketch of me is in there. That's really cool. It's a skeleton samurai. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's really tiny. And here the story continues. There are two short stories in there and a couple pinups. It's a beautiful book done by Robert Renvans and and his and his and his, uh, and his friends. Um, and uh, yeah, I know them since they started buying my comic books uh, back in 2000. And uh, I always meet them at the comic book conventions, and we we swap war stories and talk about storytelling. Uh, and I'm very happy that, that they are my friends now. And I'm very happy that they also, like me, went from being comic book fans to being comic book creators, because that is the way we all go, from fans to creators. And, and they actually uh, do this on the side. They have real jobs, unlike me, which is my, my main profession is this. They have real jobs, and they just do it for the passion. And for me, that is super inspiring, because... It shows me that what I'm doing apparently has meaning. And my job is something that we should pursue, not only for money, but actually for pleasure. Uh, and I'm doing it for 20 years. I'm still enjoying drawing, uh, drawing stories. And uh, yeah, this just pushes, pushes me to get better. And I'm very happy if I get to see uh, people grow in their art. And uh, if you want to follow him, uh, he's also on, on Instagram. So Solanum80 is here. He also loves kaiju and giant monsters, but also loves stuff like Stan Sakai, Usagi Ujimbo. Who doesn't love a samurai rabbit? And uh, yeah, they uh, they do amazing artwork um, on, a, on on a small scale. This is like this is like an A5 comic book. It's not fully comic book size. It's very efficiently done. It's nicely uh, bound, good paper, like really good quality. 
And uh, yeah, that's when you realize people are really passionate about art. We can also see is in this page here from the next issue. Steel, the robot samurai, is coming into a village. And there are a couple of hoodlums that uh, um, have an interest in him. And they see him going into a bar. And it doesn't take long until they catch up with him. And they go like, hey, dude, come outside. You, you have to pay a toll uh, or we're going we're gonna to mess up. Uh, we're going to mess with you. Um, so they go outside, have a battle. But I'm going to focus on, on this page here. So we see a lot of detail in this page, a lot of cool stuff um, that is being thought of to bring over this Japanese feudal Japan atmosphere, but still make it robots. Um, a lot of detail, a lot of thinking. If, if you can do this in one hour, you're also great. This, this is probably has taken more time. So the more detail you put in, the more time it takes. Um, but it's all about the storytelling. And yeah, we'll go through it uh, tier by tier. I had some ideas what to change and I tried to not change the style. And you will see that I used 90% of his artwork I used in my corrected version. I just copy pasted, flipped it around and did stuff with it. And then I added it a little bit, embellished it a little bit, pushed it a little bit, which is much easier if you look at it with foreign eyes and haven't drawn it yourself and go like, can I read this? Does this read when it's small? For example, if I make this really small, you see in the first page, steel gets lost. We actually don't barely see the character. It doesn't pop out a lot. So this is something I wanted to address. So this is the first tier, the first panel, and I addressed it thusly. Yeah. He's in the panel now. He's actually featured. I put a, a zip -a tone, a screen tone over it, and I used uh, Kyle's uh, Kyle Zipitone effect brush um, from Photoshop in this. Back in the day, we actually had to cut this out and glue this on a page, and it's 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 a very tedious project uh, process. And uh, oopsie, uh, something is not working. Photoshop does not react. Oh, now it does. There was a little bit of a lag here. Um, give me one second to to let Photoshop clear its cache. All good. It's not Adobe Live for nothing. It's not Adobe Live for nothing. We're doing it live. Yeah. Um, while, yeah. while while Adobe's uh, composing itself, uh, if anybody has additional questions for Klaus, be sure to pop them in the chat. And for people who are watching on different platforms, please go to behance.net slash Adobe Live. And there uh, I can see your questions. Yeah, that's wonderful. Please keep them coming, everyone. Um, so. Um, Let's compare the before and after of, of this tier. And Photoshop is going like really slow here now on me for some reason. Uh, maybe I should have restarted my computer this morning. So what we have done essentially uh, is that we freed Steel. That's the character of the samurai. This part actually doesn't belong to him. We have a lot of, um, let me open up a new layer so I can draw over it and illustrate this a little bit. And. Uh, if we, if, if we look at this here, this flag looks like it's, it belongs to him a little bit. It's, it's something in there. We have thick elements here and we have thick elements here, even though both elements are on different planes, right? They, they're much further apart. So they shouldn't be as black or they need to be separated better from this. Also one thing, he actually goes in here. Um, that's nice, but this is basically outside the life area. I talked about the rule of thirds yesterday and I made up these thirds. Just cut it into thirds. And when you do this, um, it will force you, it will create like, like these uh, meeting points where those lines meet. Those points have no importance. The only thing that they do is they pull the main subject matter in, into the picture and separate them nicely, like higher up, bit low, more to the rest, left, more to the right. It forces you to make decisions. And then there's something that I call the life area. I'm going to make this in green now. So this is basically the middle part of this. And I would call this the life area of, in the rule of thirds, right? Just the life area of a comic book page. The same rules apply for, um, for anything that is within a panel. And if we put something, for example, on this spot, like a character, if we put a character here, uh, then we could put a word balloon here strategically. And it's very open and very simple and it, it, it really helps us uh, remember where we want to have stuff. So let's check out what happened here. Oopsie, uh, exactly what I, what I proposed. The character is now closer to one of the meeting points here, the crossing points, and his, his aim where he wants to go 
is is illustrated so we see him going this direction uh the only thing i basically kept is these characters in the middle there's some backroom dealing here or something romantic going on i'm not sure there's the geisha bot i think in the background uh that's really cool there's so much so many nice ideas in there um and yeah i just i just love the subject matter too it's exactly up my alley samurai robots gritty action yeah it's really cool so let's go to the second tier. Let's see what, what happened here. So this is the second tier. Two hoodlums stand around and he's passing. That's good. He doesn't notice them or he doesn't pay attention to them. He probably noticed because he's like the Satoichi of the robot world. And um, let's see what I changed here. So this is this is the before and the after. For what I changed here is the, the scale and the size. What I wanted to do is separate those two entities, the two hoodlums, and the hero more in terms of depth. I also added the screen tone, which gives it a bit of continuity and also gives it more depth. If we make this really small like this, um, you will see an immediate other read of, of this image if I turn it off and on again. Now they're basically standing in the same plane and now they're no longer very simple simple technique also what i did is i created some uh some overlap here i could have actually overlapped this character i could have gone in here and uh and take this character and move it move it up and have it really go over into the other panel i decided against this for now if you want to make it pop more you can do this and it's fair game right now because we go from this panel to here then to his head and then we see the hoodlums right we see him first he's walking and then we notice oh those two guys those two goons have uh have an interest in him for some reason um so uh, this reads better on the scale dimension super nice. very, simple, very simple correction barely added anything i just added some thick outlines to make it read even more i have the line rate variation stronger everything in the foreground gets a thick outline when i say thick i mean like eight times as big, 10 times as big as the normal outline. You can do this. This is not a problem in comic books, but mostly um, if people, if it's not your style, then that's one thing. And I don't want to invade other people's style, but um, yeah, a lot of comic books can do this and we must not be afraid of going from a, from a thin outline to a thick outline and make it, make it, uh, give it more oomph. There's a question regarding the use of the halftone. Sandrina asks, is there an actual technical reason to use halftone patterns now, or is it just an aesthetic choice? T today, it's an aesthetic choice. Back in the day, it was a printing technique. You only had black and white, for example, in Savage Sword of Conan. If you read those, I have a comic lying around of Savage Sword somewhere. Um, and uh, you only had black and white. So the only way of doing this was that. Later on, better printing techniques, you had you actually had grays, right? You can do ink wash techniques, and you can see how it, how it reads. But yeah, zipper tone, screen tone was a great technique. Today, it's a style choice. And if I do black and white, you know what? Screen tone is kind of cool. It adds some attention, it adds some detail. It sometimes looks a bit weird if, if you have it on the computer. So for printing, I think it's actually better to use it than here. If it gets too small, it forms a moiré pattern and it looks kind of weird. You can see it now in Photoshop. It, it doesn't compute uh, that anymore. Uh, our eyes correct it automatically, but here it looks kind of weird if it gets tiny. For example, if you shrink it down on a phone, uh, using this for webtoons might not be the best choice because it might not read. Not sure. But let's continue with this one. Uh, we are almost half through with our masterclass today. So I'm like, time is flying by and I have so much to address. Oh goodness, you're right. Jeez, this has flown by so far. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's, let's dive into, into the third tier. Let's see if that works. And here we go. So I'm going to increase this a little bit. And being a bit slow here, trying to move this up. So let's look at the tiers here. Let's look what we changed. And this is addressing exactly what uh, the gentleman from the, from the chat asked about. He asked about timing. How much do you actually put in there? And if we, if we look at this, uh, the main beats are, are, are done here, right? So the writer uh, did a good job. Like, oh, okay, our character Steel enters the bar. We see it from up top. You know, there's some... 
uh, some beams up there with some technology. It's all a mix of technology and, 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 and human things and natural things in this world. And then our hero sits at the bar, not at the bar, but uh, inside the bar at the table, drinks his sake, sake oil or whatever it is. And, and the, three, the three goons come in. There are three now. And uh, yeah, they, they got support from a guy with a huge axe. Um, and they have an axe to grind, apparently, with, with our friend Steel here. Um, this works, this tells the story, but this is a little bit um, too fast. There's too much stuff happening at the same time. What is happening in, in, this, in these two panels? He's coming in, he obviously has to sit down at the table, and then the hoodlums come in. Those are three beats, those are three things, but they are done in two comic books. And it's not really possible to show a character coming in and sitting down at the same time. If you actually want to make that entrance a big part of the story, if you want to put a caption here, so like five minutes later in the inn and seeing, we see him already seated, you know, that's fine, that's, that's okay. Um, it's more like an illustration then with like captions doing part of the narration, that's cool. But in this stuff, without dialogue, we have to really be sure that we nail every beat. So I added a beat in here, and that is basically the biggest change that I did. There's other stuff too, um, but this is the biggest thing. So I have him go in and actually brought him a little bit closer. So what Robert did there, he placed him here, so there's a big empty spot in the middle. And this is, this is nice to show the bar is empty or some room, there's room there, he enters alone. It's okay, but still, the central element of the picture is empty in the middle. And that's only used when I want to show like an empty graveyard, an empty scene. When I, I am supposed to wander around, who's there, what's going on, what's going on with these characters, who's watching us. And then we have another scene, another shot where there's empty space between them. Is that important for the storytelling? Do you want to alert us to the ground? Do you want to alert us to the fact that they're far apart, so they need to space to cover to in order to engage each other? No, that is actually not part of that storytelling right here, right now. So I had to change that, uh, that director, that choice of the writer. So we see here, um, I added zipper tone, added the screen tone again to quickly uh, make, it, make it read. If I make this smaller and zoom out, you can see it still reads as there's the foreground and there's the background. And if I take this away, Ah, it's everything is like put next to each other. Everything is on the same plane, same detail, same line weight almost. Um, so the depth doesn't read. And depth is the most important thing you can have in visual storytelling. It's more important than detail. And believe me, I've done all those mistakes. I have done detail so much. Like I've invested 20 hours into one, one drawing of two heroes fighting and I could have done it in half the time and the picture would have been better just because I would have uh, put less less detail in here. Um, but let's uh, let's look at the let's look at what I did here. So I entered, I put in a frame that is actually an open frame. Sandrine will be if she's back in the chat. She'll be like, "Yay, open open frame the pictures again." Um, so yeah, I love those two and they're really nice. They also like take the speed out of the reading because the picture is different. So you spend a different time on it. You spend different attention on it. So this is a calm scene and Robert introduced the calmness of that good, but he also put some tension in there because we are being watched. And he sits down. We still don't see his face. I avoided that. Uh, his face is not fully seen here. Here we don't see his face. Uh, so um, we don't need to have that. We always want to need, want to add some mystery. In, into the storytelling and how we sh chose our angle. So it's very Quentin Tarantino here. Like there's a, there's a Mexican coming in. There's always a shadow on his face. And when you think you get to see it, no, there's more shadow. Um, that's really good. Um, so we try, I tried to do this here. He's sitting down. I gave him a chair to sit down with a little bit of a pattern there that looks techno and mechanical. We see his hand here. I tried to copy the style of that a little bit. And we see his kimono. Um, is, is there, so I, I took the design from him. So I just added in this frame, and now he's coming in, he's calmly sitting down, and then oh, a moment later, he just tries to drink his first sip of sake, these three hoodlums come in. And uh, there is still space between them, um, but I could have moved them actually more down, but I wanted to maintain the detail of the table in here, 
and I also uh, wanted to place them a little bit higher. And that is something that's always good um, to do and to know about. When you place a character higher in the picture, they are more powerful in general. Like it's like a low angle, doing a low angle shot. Something is, you are below somebody. That's why you're less powerful. So this character, not powerful. We see him from above. And now these characters are above him in the panel. And uh, yeah, I actually uh, still wanted to make that happen that they are high up in the frame, even though I have this. But now it works better with, uh, with the eye line and with the horizon line. And it's, and it's uh, a bit, uh, I would say, smarter in the composition, a bit more economic as well. So I hope um, this, these changes were good. I hope the artist agrees that they were good. Maybe you can, you can adapt them like you did, Molly. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, again, when I give feedback, it's just suggestions. Uh, I'm not telling you like you have to do it this way and my way is the only way to doing this. We have seen that today or yesterday that the, with the Spider-Man page, it's a generic story, but if you change aspects of it, you can do it differently and you can decide for a different money shot and you can decide to, with different panel sizes to give something more emphasis and this is, yeah, this is being a director. And that's the fun of comic books, that there's always more than one solution. As you are talking about um, which elements to include in the frame, Daryl has a question that's uh, related to that, which is, are you constantly aware of using the same shapes in a panel? Like, for example, using the moon in the Spider-Man page from, yes from yesterday, would adding a moon again behind Spider-Man be too repetitive in one page? Um, yeah, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't always do it. Um, it, it. It might be. It might be repetitive. We talked about it when we looked at the Phantom pages, like the really old ones that were not so good. There's really good Phantom material out there, as we said. Uh, but yeah, they were very repetitive in terms of like the size of the characters. And even if you bring in elements in the background and repeat them in the same way from the same angle, that's kind of boring. In storyboarding, that's okay. So a lot of storyboard artists that transition into comic books always do like. Uh, non-Dutch angle, even horizon, smack in the middle, uh, very timid, like characters standing there talking like this, right? Like, hey, you owe me money. Uh, but in a comic book, she'll be like, you are owing me money. Give me back my, my, my dollars. It's, it, has, it needs different sensibilities to do this. And even if you can render like a superstar, doesn't mean you're a good storyteller in terms of comic books or in terms of storyboarding. Um, rendering is something completely different from this. But yeah, let's not keep it too repetitive. For example, like to putting two side shots of steel into the same page or actually on the same double page spread because double pages are, are important that will read as repetitive. We immediately pick our patterns. We're pattern seeking animals. So if we see the same headshot, the same shape, um, the same side shot of a character, on a double page spread, we immediately go like, oh yeah, it's lazy storytelling. There's nothing exciting here. It's different in storyboarding because things are things are separated by time and you forget what that shape was before. So it actually helps us recognize what character is talking. Um, in comic books, we have to offer them, we have to offer our audience something amazing, something diverse and something entertaining. There's one more question about this page before you move on to the next one. Albors asks, um, uh, I have a bit of a strange question, but for example, is there a reason that the guy's head is looking to the right and say, then say to the left? I'm not sure if this question's a bit vague. I think he's asking in the second tier, um, what is the reason behind why he's looking to the right rather than looking to the left? Um, you mean like this character here? The uh, uh, steel. Oh, steel is looking to the right? Yeah, why not the left? Oh, why isn't he going left? Yeah. Oh, because, because this is a Western comic book. This is still American style comic book. Uh, I got a couple other submissions from, from artists who wanted to show me stuff for, uh, for getting a review, but their material was too different. You know, like Webtoons, for example, it's a very different way of consuming uh, juxtaposed pictorial and other elements in the deliberate sequence, AKA comic books. Um, and, and uh, yeah, this is a Western way of reading this. So we obviously went from, we read comic books from basically top left to top to bottom right. And then we go through the picture and go to the important points of, of something, of a, of, of a panel. Um, the, the thing, the important thing is just that basically um, uh, this is a Western style thing and he has passed these people. We could 
invert this image, flip it horizontal, wouldn't be a problem, but there would be one change. Let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I, I don't know if I can, can I change the, the entire group? Um, I don't know if that works. Um, let me see if I can uh, edit, transform, flip horizontal, transform. No, I think I can't. I think I have to render it out again. Like, let's make a, I love this. I love these questions. It's so interesting. Uh, we will see what hap what's happening there. Uh, I'm going to go with duplicate image. Making a copy of this. Still the same thing. And now I'm going to edit, transform, and flip horizontal, right? Shouldn't that be there? Uh, transform. Oh, on, this is weird. Oh, oh, it's still it's it's still the copy. I'm sorry. I have to I have to render it down as a uh, as a text as a as a pixel. How does that work? Um, oh yeah. Merge group. Now I merged the group, and now I should be able to edit it and transform it and flip horizontal. Doesn't work. What's going on there? You could try transform and then drag the one side to the other side. It's also oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do that with my with my hands and then because Photoshop will like flip it perfectly horizontally. Um, yeah, this should be this should be possible now, right? Well, that's the entire picture. Transform. Wait, what is it? Transform. It's what? Oh, it's down there. Oh, sorry about this. Yeah, this is called... intervened and told you. Thank you very much. Uh, flip horizontal. Boom. We have the other way now. We have some some mistakes in there from the rendering. Sorry about this. So this just happens. So um, so we have flipped it around. So what has happened? What has changed now? And I can tell you what has changed. The way he's walking has changed. He's now meandering. He's going to the right in this panel. And now all of a sudden he's going to the left. Why is that? Why, why the big change about that? Uh, in, uh, in storyboarding terms, we would call that jumping the line. In comic books, this is often not a biggie. No problem doing it this way. So for a comic book, this would work. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't need this. We have him on the left, some other people on the right, him on the left, other people on the right. Notice something, it's repetitive. So there are a lot of reasons why this character was placed absolutely perfectly. Um, so um, yeah, that's just a, but it's a good, good question. Like um, if I now flip the first panel horizontally also, it would work again. Then he would go from right to left and all that stuff. But I might want to start because he's the hero character. I might want to start with him moving into the picture from the left, from the Western perspective of reading comic books. Uh, and this is what I grew up with. So um, uh, this is what this masterclass is all about. It's bringing your own hero. And heroes and superheroes are uh, uh, an American thing, really. Um, and, and that's why I use this style. And I fell in love with comic books back in the day. So um, yeah. I, I couldn't help myself. So that's why I draw on this style and, and judge everything with through this lens. If you do children's books illustration, or if you do manga, for example, you might not want to come to me for feedback because I'm not the expert for that stuff. There are other people who do it. Or animation, you know. Then you go to Molly. Um, or creature design. You go to Molly, right? You're giving a master class. You're giving a, a class at the HKU in Utrecht. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not the expert for all these things. But when it, come, when it comes to Americans, Storytelling, you come to Klaus. But we're running out of time. We have half an hour left, and I still have some some cool things to address. And there might still be more questions from people in the chat. Yeah, keep the questions coming, guys. These are really these are really really good. Wonderful. So I can I can close this. Actually, I'm going to close this. That changes nope. And. Uh, yeah, I want to go into into some Transformers territory here. Um, this is the the Grimlock illustration because we're talking about hashtag Bring Your Own Hero. So I did this this cover for um, for a spotlight for one book that is all about um, stories with Grimlock. Grimlock is one of the Dinobots, uh, one of the robots that transformed into a dinosaur uh, from the Transformers universe. He's really cool. He's an epic hero. He's ginormous. And uh, yeah, I, I colored this as well in this specific style. 
um, and you can see how much the how much color adds really to the atmosphere. But it also everything has to work out in pencil. This is a real pencil drawing that I scanned in, cleaned up in Photoshop, and uh, and then and then put the layer on multiply, and then paint it under it. So it's a very simple technique of doing this. Maybe I can go into this at the end if we have some more times. Some more time, I, I might be able to go into uh, the GI Joe cover that I didn't get to talk about in the first two sessions. We'll see. So this is a giant hero. Um, the cool thing about the coloring here, and um, be aware, this also has to work in black and white. But I have anchored. Um, I have put attention here um, into this. I have. Let me start over. I've used a technique here to bring attention to certain things in this image, and I used it with color and with highlight. So I, I used dark and I used light. So we have three spots that are of interest in this picture, three or four basically. One is his face with a red visor. One is the sword also burning in red, coincidence. Uh, one is this highlight here. And the other thing is this claw, this shape uh, that goes against, the, uh, that goes against the, the lit up background here. So those are four points and the eye will always go probably from the sword and then wants to go up here and goes to the face because the face is really small, depending on where you're coming from. Like if there's a great logo here, right? Your eyes might go to his face and go up here and it will always go in a circle. And this is good. This is good for storytelling, for visual storytelling. If you have elements in the picture that guide the eye through and around the picture, but it never actually leaves the picture plane. There's always something cool next to it and you make it different. Uh, so it's not repetitive. So this highlight is not red. This highlight is not red um, because of the lighting of the scene. I could have made it monochromous, right? And, and make, it, make it all red, but th this would have taken away from the visual interest of this picture. So when it comes to computer, computer comic book coloring, please keep that in mind. Keep it diverse um, and, and make sure you don't put highlights everywhere because I, I could have totally gone into this, into this picture and just, just added another highlight down here for some reason, right? Just add a highlight down here. Oh yeah, it's really cool. Look how, how the foot pops out now. And um, my Photoshop is like super small, super slow. I don't know what's going on here. Hope I don't have to do a restart, but I can do a, I can, I can put a highlight down here. Yeah, but now attention is pulled to this foot and I don't want this. This is not an interesting part of the area. It's of the, of the, uh, of the composition and it's outside the life area. Remember the life area? We want to keep all that is of interest in, in this frame of the, com uh, of the, of the composition. And it, takes three seconds or four that the lines are being created. My computer is super slow. Um, no clue how, how this is happening, but there's nothing I can do right now except doing a restart. So we're going to power through and, and use the last 25 minutes to, um, to go with it. Wow, that, was, that took a long time. Okay, so much for coloring and for coming to uh, talking about big heroes. And now we're going to talk about a small hero. And then we're going to talk about page width panels for one second, because that's also really important. Um, close this, save changes. No, that's cool. Close this down, close this down. Um, okay, that's good. It's all good. Um, uh, this is the Zenny Beast stuff. I can close this also just to reduce performance issues that my computer has. Um, yeah, and let's, let's talk about this comic here. So, it should get bigger now, but it doesn't. There's a severe lag going on. That will that will take away like something else will drop behind, <laughs> drop off the table because we got. I, I need every second to, to actually to make this work. But we'll power through it. Okay, so this is a double page. This is actually the first page of the comic book. And when you have a comic book like this, maybe we can go close it in on the camera. So this is a variant cover that I did where you just see the pencil drawings. So if you open it up. The first page of a comic book is always a right-hand page because this page is normally used either for credits, like in this case, or for advertisement. And the same thing happens in, in the back, right? There's always advertisement in the back and the back story too. So the story always ends on a right-hand, on a, on, on a, on a left-hand page. That's how it goes. 
and the rest is is double page and sometimes it's it's double page spreads like this where a panel actually goes over both the um over both the pages and that takes a little bit of fiddling and a lot of attention to how the eye is moving over the page what we know is that like a piece of vocabulary like like in dialogue uh, or in writing, you have individual, you have, you have uh, paragraphs, you have pages, you have paragraphs, you have words, and then you have syllables. So all those are elements of storytelling, right? So this, in the same way, we have this in comic books. If we go back to, the, to Photoshop and, and into the page. So what we have is we have word balloons, we have faces, and we have hands, those three main elements of something, uh, of, of storytelling within that and all the other details. And then we have panels, we have tiers, one tier, second tier in the middle, third tier down here, and we have individual panels. So those are our, this is our vocabulary. But also we have, what we have to take into account is that we have double pages because stories are read in double pages. So I'm gonna open up now. I hope my machine still does it. Yeah, it worked and super fast, that's good. So we have a double page spread here. Um, and uh, um, and we have to know as a writer, as, as a storyteller and on that phase already, what is happening in the last panel of a double page spread. Because when you turn the page, that is when things get exciting. So if you have Tarzan fighting with a crocodile and Tarzan gets eaten on this, on this last panel, is no, of no interest. I'm going to flip over, come to this double page. I see Tarzan fighting everywhere. And it's amazing, amazing, but he gets eaten here. Why did I look at the fighting? I already know that he's getting eaten, right? I always have Tarzan getting eaten on the next page, or actually he frees and he wins. He frees himself and he wins against the crocodile. Um, so um, that is important to know that these double pages exist and they have a huge effect on how a story is, is read. It's not only the single page. Be aware of your medium. Webtoons, again, works completely different. There's a question about the cover that you showed at the risk of, um, I hope uh, if you have to open it, I hope it doesn't make uh, your computer explode. But uh, with the Grimlock cover, yeah. uh, John Charles asks, I noticed that in the black and white sketch for the cover, there's a lot of detail that's hidden, like on the foot, for example. Is there a reason by, for this? It's hidden by the color. Um. It's hidden by the color. Let's, op let's open it up. Let's open it up, put it over here. Photoshop opens it up in the right size. Boom, and we can compare. Yeah, there's a lot of detail here that I have to draw in. Drawing giant robots is hard work. Right. Hard work. Like drawing a human leg, takes me 10 seconds. Drawing a robot leg, two minutes. It's, it's super clear. You cannot leave anything out. If you leave stuff out, they go like, wait a second, doesn't he have like a light or a, like a, a ventilation shaft in his left or in his left leg or something like that? Or aren't there claws that from the robot shape in the, uh, on, on his arms or something like that? On the, aren't, isn't there a servo system and the, it, isn't there a screw or something in here where he, where he turns his, his, his elbow? Uh, that all has to go in there. If I had been a bit smarter about this, but back then I wasn't, um, and I mentioned that tip for you in one of the last master classes. It's be aware of your lighting when you construct the figure on the page. If I had known I would color it with backlighting, I would have left out all this detail here. That's not necessary. I would have put a stronger uh, rim light maybe here um, and uh, and just 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 hit this right. There's a lot of detail that I don't need to need to see, like all those. Excuse me again. Um, all those scratches here that we see in his armor, they're basically gone because they're not important for that storytelling. I have to show him in a heroic pose and he's battle hardened indeed. Um, however, if I draw in all this detail, the pencil drawing is going to look more awesome and I can sell it for money. Wow, that, that, that's a very interesting answer. And I did not, ex that I didn't expect. Good question, John Charles. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, very good, yeah. So you see, like uh, the the the, uh, the the detail and the uh, where the attention goes is very different on this one. There's a lot of stuff going on here, and maybe the sword is actually featuring more, and his head is bit featuring a little bit more because it's darker. So um, yeah, it's 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 quite different. I'm going to close this down um, and and go back to the double pages. Um, and uh, yeah, if you do a, a comic book, 
And if you do, um, if you want to sell a comic book, um, it needs to read fast. So it has to be simple. Um, if you want to sell one comic book and wow people and draw them in, you make the artwork really amazing. Um, as of the second comic book, they don't care that much anymore about the artwork. It's really weird. And by artwork, I mean rendering, you know, artwork is storytelling. So they care about storytelling that has to work. But if you change the artist after like two or three issues and you choose somebody with a simpler style, that's it's more more available for the company and that can can execute the pages faster. But the storytelling is good. People will not really complain. Um, because we are all about storytelling and it's it's no longer about, oh yeah, this, this, this face is rendered so amazingly or there's so much light and shadow in there or it's fully painted and photo real. We don't need that. I'm not interested in photo real. I'm interested in your style that you bring to the table, your vision of things. How do you see the world? Where do you place detail? Where do you place story? That's, that's, what I, uh, that's what I'm interested in. That's why also, for example, like fully computer automated uh, intelligence, uh, intelligence, AI um, uh, generated images don't interest me because there's no person behind it. I'm, I'm interested in your vision. I'm very, really partial to artwork created by humans. And uh, it's nice if you have a technology like Photoshop that enables human art to thrive. And that's, that's what we want. So if we look at a double page like this, uh, this is actually not really a double page, so um, uh, this is a single page. So I'm going to hide uh, this part of it for a second. Just going to fill it up on a new layer. Let me see. So we're not distracted by that, by all the credits. And uh, so yeah, we we go we go right into the action of this um, of this um, of this comic book. And if you're able to to introduce people into a story really fast, that is really important. Um, good storytellers never start with, uh, oh, let me tell you a story about something I heard that happened six months ago. This is one sentence, you're already bored. It's much better if you, if you start with, my friend died in the war. And then you're in, right? What war is it? Oh my God, what's going on? You, you try to get people into the story really fast. And that's what we did here in a, in a really cool way. So we're introducing this little hero. His name is Wheelie. Everybody hates him. He's a character that in the Transformers universe is not liked because he speaks in rhyme. In this comic book, you find out why he's speaking in rhyme. And when we start, he's not yet speaking in rhyme, actually. Um, so uh, we meet him here in this scene, and we see he's tiny. He's, he's, he's not really big. The big robots are fighting the, the great Cybertron war. And uh, he's just a support guy, right? He brings Ultra Magnus, the super cool robot, uh, some reserve artillery here. And yeah, he talks about himself here in those captions. He, he thinks about what has happened. And we see these panels are rounded. They have a little rounded shape. And that, that uh, shows that this is a flashback sequence. Um, this, is, this is how I, uh, and often in American comic books, flashbacks are shown like that. Um, you can also do something different with the border. But whenever you change something on the page, you change a style, it's noticed and it, and it's, it changes the, the way you communicate story and people, people uh, pay attention to that. So he's tiny. So we look down on him and uh, yeah, he's really upbeat. He's optimistic. He knew like sooner or later he would actually get a shot. And uh, yeah, he got like, he, 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 they gave him a mission. They point towards the ship and they're like, oh, he goes like, really? No way. I mean, I won't let you down. Like he's excited. He, he wants to prove himself. And, uh, and and go on a on a on a mission for for the other robots to find new planets to get energon from, uh, which is the uh, the stuff that they drink and they consume to have to have energy, and yeah, so he won't let them down, but the scout ship did. So uh, yeah, his navigational systems are are failing. He's getting into a, a storm just like in Star Trek, and uh, he he uh, is is calling for help over the micro uh, over the um, uh, intercom system right to his friends light years away and then he's like is anyone listening to me and we do a caption here we actually don't do a word balloon so this is a, a nice voiceover that we have here and he's yeah he's going down on the planet and then we're gonna look into what is happening next boom wow this is a complete different change in pace in atmosphere, almost in style, because we have different lighting situation. And this is a double page spread. So you really go from this detailed 
cool action night scene with a lot going on, lots of panels, boom, mm -hmm. to this page. And uh, Klaus from, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago would have been like, oh, the artist was lazy. He didn't want to draw anything. So he drew him in an empty desert. And I mean, like, I, I could have gone in here and draw in like, like huge mountains, you know, and make them really detailed and draw mountains in the background or anything like that. But I didn't want to. Why didn't I want to? Because I wanted to show that the character is small. And uh, I wanted to show emptiness. And we talked about how do we determine panel size? I mean, this could have been one panel, right? Like a small panel and then have, a, have them in here and show emptiness. But I wanted to maximize it. And I wanted to maximize the difference. And we see him, he's like a cowboy that lost his horse. The horse died and he took, takes the saddle over his shoulder. So we have a lot of that trope, this imagery going on. He's the lone cowboy. Also, if we, if we look at it closely, something has happened to his arm. His arm is not okay. This guy is beaten up. The color has gone away from his arm. Well, on the first page, we showed that he was completely orange. And then in comes Simon Furman, the writer from England, uh, one of the most experienced writers in Transformers history. Um, and uh, I concocted <clears throat> this story together with him. I had this idea for, for a wheelie story. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is giving up. And, um, and I had this idea for the wheelie story. I pitched it to Chris Ryle. Hi, Chris. And uh, yeah, then I, I joined forces with Simon Furman because he's an amazing writer. And we have seen it from all my spelling mistakes. I'm not a great writer. I have ideas for scenes. I, have, I know how to make scenes work in a visual way. And I find mistakes in your storytelling if you bring it to me, if you bring a story to me. But concocting one yourself, that's a different skill. Um, ask me again in a year or so when I've written a couple stories and screenplays. Let's see how that works out. So this is this is really important. And I have not placed him in the middle. That's something I would never do. So if you have a double page spread, you don't put your character in the middle. Why don't you? Because you have a fold in real comic books. And if, if you put a character in the middle, stuff is lost. There's much more information in there. So you have to you have to tell it. Um, have to part it, right? I did it on this double page spread. You see there's a giant, giant margin in the middle of the page, even though all those dial, all those panels are basically on this, on this tier. We have the big overarching one, and then we carry on here. But I put this in here, but because if it's, if it's, for example, published in a trade paperback and it's thicker, a lot of stuff gets lost. And we have to make sure that everything is in the life area and we don't lose dialogue or we don't use characters. Never place an element centrally in the middle of a double page spread, especially to faces. If you do a face and the printing is askew a little bit, the face will be askew a little bit. So it's very clear that there's a word balloon on this page that belongs to him and Wheelie is writing here and there are more word balloons. I didn't place Wheelie in the middle of this picture. And that is intentional, that is knowledge, and that is how we should do it. But you try this out, you acquire the knowledge, you fail, and then you come back and do it better the next time. That's uh, that's the way we have to learn. And that's how everybody does it. Indeed. Umicorn says, now I want to read the comic. I agree with you. The, I really like I really like this comic. It's one of my favorite comics that you've worked on, actually, Klaus. It's really good. Seek it out, but people. Thank you. Yeah, it's available in trade paperback from IDW, I believe. Um, so it's Spotlight Wheelie. Uh, you just Google it and you'll, you'll find it, I'm, I'm sure. It's from IDW Publishing. And it's, it's, it's a great achievement. And in terms of storytelling, I do some really neat things there. Um, just like the double page spread, just like varying panel sizes. Um, and together with Simon Furman, who's such an experienced writer, we can use caption to our advantage. So we skip stuff with captions and put a caption of something that belongs to one panel that we put it into the next panel and it segues nicely, it transitions very nicely. Um, yeah, check it out. It's, it's, it's an achievement I still treasure to this day. Um, but, oh man, we have 10 minutes left. That might just be enough to talk a little bit about lettering. Shall we? Let's do it. Okay, cool. So I got something cool here. Um, this is a comic book. This is a comic story that Levin Curio wrote. Levin Curio has a publishing house called Weißblech Comics, weißblechcomics.com in Germany. And he does his own line of comics. One of the lines is called Horror Shocker. Uh, it's basically tales from the crypt, but done by German artists. And they have short stories. And it's basically 
right now in Germany, the only horror anthology that we have. And it's really good. Uh, they had issue like 69, 70 by now. So they have been doing this since 2004. They publish like four issues a day. This is one of the newest ones. And actually in this issue, which is uh, issue 64, it's about a slime monster taking over a city. It's a really, really cool story. Um, but back in there, there's multiple, right? It's an anthology. And if you want to see the, the page in color, uh, you can check it out in this comic book and you can check it out on the website as well. But if you want to read the entire four page story, it's really compact. Uh, grab the book. It's only in German right now. We'll try to get it into English and get it into heavy metal mean heavy metal magazine or something like that. So if we go back into into this, I can just look to, to this page here. It's opening up. Um, so this is the web, the website, and this is where you can buy the book. You can see in here, there's the there's the page in the middle in color, but only the first page. I'm not going to spoil you on that. Uh, we will just look at lettering and at black and white artwork because that's that's what I love. Um, so lettering here was done by Gunther Klippe. Uh, translation was provided by Samir Glidos back then. Uh, Louisa Preisler helped me on the colors. So it's again, it takes a village to make a comic book. And uh, yeah, get good people around you like Molly, sometimes even animators and artists from Japan, make it an international crew, get people together and make your own comics and yeah, bring your own hero. So um, I hope I can inspire you to, to actually do this, pick up the pencil. And if I do this masterclass again in a year, I hope you send me some material to my Instagram private message and then I can look over your artwork as well. But let's stay with this lettering here because uh, we did something really cool here. We, we did the title. Um, and the title uh, has to look cool. It doesn't have to. It can also be very simple looking, but it has to fit with the, with the message and the atmosphere of what you do. This is a medieval story. So we needed a medieval font and we, did it mid me we needed medieval style um, to make it connect. And you can see here how the caption, let me see if that is, uh, yeah, how the caption here is intersecting. I don't know if this has color. Uh, I think this is in grayscale. It doesn't have color. Um, how it intersects with the, um, with the title. So there's multiple outlines and it's really nicely and neatly put together. This was hard work. I sat down with, with Gunther on this and we, uh, we agonized over it, how to do it the best way. And he's, he's an expert in illustrator. So, uh, lettering is done with Photoshop, uh, with Adobe illustrator. Uh, normally, Richard Stockings does it with that program, and I do it with that program too if I do it myself. And he used it as well. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just amazing uh, what it enables you to do. And it's super sharp. It reads very well in the comic book. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we made this actually in two languages. So if you want to see the German version, Die Gnade Gottes, then you can see the German one. Actually, there's a little change in here. Uh, you can see that here we, we stopped doing the second outline. So it, I think it even intersects nicer with the framing of the panel because we have white, normally it's white uh, uh, around it, the margin area. And uh, yeah, this is, this is the beauty of comic books, right? When you can just use your medium in order to affect what you're doing on the page. So it's very like creating a poster that is uh, that has to have a certain effect on people. And you can do stuff in posters that you cannot do on, for advertisement on, on the internet, for example. It's very different. If you publish with Webtoons and do like the individual pa panels that are being scrolled around, that's different storytelling than this. So be aware of your, um, of your, um, of your medium. Are there any questions regarding this stuff? I, I don't know. We, we only have a few minutes left. So this is your last chance to ask me a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to go, go for it. There, there's currently no questions in the chat. So whatever, whatever you need to say, say it. Fantastic. Yeah. So to, to wrap this up, um, yeah, let's talk about lettering uh, a, a, a short moment here uh, because we have so little time left. So there's a woman and she goes over the battlefield and I'm going to switch to the English version of that. So you can read it if you if you so choose to. So she goes over the battlefield after a battle. And uh, yeah, she's um, she's one of the people who travels with the army. So she's not in the army. But back then, armies need a lot of food and uh, armor being repaired and all that stuff. And uh, as we know, um, we might not know, army is not about strategy only. It's also about logistics, like how do, how do you bring food to the front? 
um, how to bring materials to the front. And she's one of those people, but her, her husband, um, yeah, he's lost in the battle and she's searching for her husband uh, among the dying and the dead of the battlefield. And this is what the story is all about. It's really intense and it has a really nice twist at the end. I love it. Um, so I had to research some weapons here, some armory, and then I just uh, drew chain mail and the swords and this, this raven um, put it in there because the birds come, you know, to, to eat the dead. It's, it's a horrific theme, scene. And yeah, again, it's something, I'm a lighthearted character. I don't do war, I don't do conflict, um, uh, but it's fun drawing and it's entertaining and it's shocking uh, to draw it. So it takes a lot of, um, it creates a lot of attention from the reader. Conflict, really good for story. So she's calling from, goes like, Eve? Eve, where are you? But she's not, she's not like, Eve, Eve, what are you doing? So we, we communicate this through changing the tail and changing the work balloon. So this work balloon could have been a burst like this. I'm just gonna draw it in here like really, um, oopsie, I should do this actually on another layer. That would be much better. But I have to use a moment to do this. Create a new layer. What do we have for layers in Photoshop? Layers are free, as they say. So you put in a... Um, a burst here, for example, and have her give her a tail that is jagged. Let me see if I can, can draw this in here. Right, make it a jagged tail and make the burst, and then give her the same the same uh, the same writing here, Eves, and and make it a, make it a an exclamation mark maybe. So this is different. This would be Eves. So it's it's very different in pronunciation. So and in and in performance. So we are also a little bit the actors. We coach the actors how to deliver their lines. And we do this with lettering and we do this with technique. So the reason this tail is long is because um, she's going eaves, so maybe increasing the volume a little bit. And it's, it's very different from the other work balloon that I just, that I just drew. So no jagged tail and, and no burst in, in this one. And if we go further, we can see what what we have done here with the work balloons. You notice that this work balloon is not as tightly, nicely rounded as the other one. Why is that? That is because the person speaking here doesn't have a good time. He's suffering. You go like, oh, help. And we have a little tail here because there's unsteadiness, but, but it's not a perfectly jagged tail. It doesn't have a sharp edge going to it. It's not, oh, oh, right like this. It's uh, and it's like trailing a little bit. So we could have done this as a tail that goes like, like this simply, but we decided for a little bit of a tail so to make it longer and to not like interrupt with any other elements. So we try to keep the lettering separated from everything. Word balloons always flow up. They're always up in the panel, ideally. And, uh, and you try to not make them, put them over faces. That's not nice. And you always put it behind things if you can. Um, so yeah, this is uh, important stuff about lettering that I wanted to address in here. Uh, I don't know if there was anything else, but we only have two minutes left. So uh, I don't know if I want to go into another into another topic, but I could indeed open the page uh, of coloring the G.I. Joe comic that I left out. Shall I do that? Oh yeah, you should go for that. And yeah, if anybody, if anybody in the chat wants to ask any last second short questions as Klaus is doing that, send them now. So by the time he's done, hopefully maybe we can still ask a couple of questions right at the end. Yeah, that would be, that'd be great. Uh, let me see if I have it and where I have it in my files. Oh my goodness. There is a lot of material I've prepared for this. Uh, making of a cover, yes. So this is the cover for a G.I. Joe comic that I drew. Don't have it here in my hand right now. It's called Snow Job. It's uh, the Snow Ranger, basically, of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. Um, and let me see if it opens up nicely. I'm going to close everything else down because this is slow. And this is my computer being on its last lag. Maybe I should buy a new computer because I don't think this is Photoshop. Okay, we have the cover right here. I'm going to... Pull it over more to the middle. Uh oh, oh. computer is freezing up. Yep, and there it goes. I'm gonna close down everything else so we conserve some uh, uh, such as nope. Just gonna close this down as well. I hope we're not gonna get back with that. And uh, yeah, this I might not need. So, this is the cover that I did, 
And the question is, how do we get to this cover? Uh, this was actually um, written by Merrill Hagen. is a great guy, super creative dude. He uh, is writing, he has been writing Teen, uh, Teen Titans Go for like years, I think. He wrote, uh, he wrote the new edition of Danger Mouse um, uh, for, for English uh, television, Irish television. Um, yeah, he's an amazingly creative person and I did this with him and that was a, that was a great joy. Um, let's, let's look at how it was created. So it's all started with a scribble, with a pencil scribble that I then scanned in. And I actually can see this. I drew in the logo and the IDW logo and all this. I had an idea here to put some text in there. Uh, so it needed text, but it's written text. So I don't want to want to draw this myself. I want to use the text tool that's in Photoshop and put that in there, give it more flavor. And yeah, he's he's running there. I gave him a funny word, but like, what? What's going on there? Because this mission profile is sending him to South America. Like a snow agent it has to go to where it's super warm. That's weird. So it's really a fish out of water situation. And that's what the comic book is all about. And that is great writing from, from Merrill Hagen here. So this is the first sketch. I sent this out to the editor and then I take it, uh, take it to the next level. And this is what's happening there. So this is a nicer pencil drawing, but this is the pencil. This is not the inks. This is not the final artwork. But now you have seen, I have actually added a photo here. You can see a clip. There were some files. It actually says files here. You see this uh, this printer paper that is cut out there. So I already uh, placed it in a different way, made this photo here. It says Playa and it says Valley. Um, and there's a person in there and there's a map in here. So there's a lot of stuff in there and I took it out and uh, I wanted to have him on the right and this map on the left. So where he's going and he's taking off his goggles in the back. So we see his eyes in a big way that really draws us, uh, draws in the attention of people going through a comic book store. And he's like, what's happening? I have to go to Caracas, like the heck. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then, um, yeah, we take it, we take it to this image and I'll take you through it real quick. Uh, how this happened. So this is um, a layer that's set to multiply. This is the pencil drawing. I darkened it. I cleaned it up a little bit in, in, in Photoshop. You can still see there's some, there's some grit on there. If I really zoom in, we can see some, some grit in this area. Um, sometimes that's kind of nice to have, to have things gritty if they are, if they're an action comic like this, and if the world is gritty that I'm, that I'm illustrating. Uh, so I, I, I set this layer to multiply and then we added flats under it just the flats for coloring first. So if we, if we move the background area, you can see that the flats are in a different layer. So this is what's happening there. It's very, very simple to do this. And these flats enable me to, um, let me see if I can go back. The flats enable me to select things, uh, to like select elements really fast. So I can go the quick select tool, do this. And then I can, for example, like do a, a, a tool in there. I'm gonna open up a new layer here. Uh, choosing uh, a different a different color and I can quickly start coloring into this thing so it's nicely masked and I don't have to think about anything. That's a really great technique of, of how to do this. And with, if you hit control H or command H, you can hide these little walking ants around it because they might be distracting. So I did that. So it went from here to here, which is several hours, oopsie, which is several hours of work. Um, but yeah. We're gonna wrap it up really soon, by the way. Um, so, so this is this is this is this is good to have. Um, and yeah, we took it to this layer, and then I added more grit and more detail, more texture, layers with texture. Up in here, I put a layer. Uh, it's on in another copy, and it's like merge or something. I don't know what the English term for that is. I'm sorry. Um, I have a German Photoshop for some reason. Maybe because I'm German, I put some camo pattern in there. Everything that gives it more flavor is 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 good in my book. And there's more. There's more snow. You see, I've drawn in snow, but later on I decided we need more snow. This looks a little bit too nice. He should be caught in the blizzard. So I added some uh, snow that is being blown about. I added some uh, some gritty snow that is flying about. Everything to to give it more texture. And then we end up. Um, with this. I added in the lettering, as you can see, and somebody like circled it with a red marker, like snow job goes to Caracas. Like, so there's some very similitude in there in this paper. But you, what you can also see is that I pushed back everything that is not snow job. That is not the character. Before, 
if you squint your eyes, he's a little bit merging with the paper. Like he's a little bit hard to see. Where's my focus? What is of primary importance? Primary importance is this guy. He needs to stick out. So I gave him a thick outline and I pushed back with a haze layer and Photoshop over it. Um, I just opened up a layer, set it to, to overlay, for example, or to lighten. And then he set it at 20% and have cut it out nicely before with the marquee tool or with the, uh, yeah, with the selection tool, sorry. And, uh, and then you end up with a cover. And then all it needs is the real, the real cover and the real typography and the real lettering uh, from the people at, at IDW. And that's how you end up with a cover. And I think now we have covered everything in terms of comic book production, like from what we can do in terms of storytelling, what we can do with panels, how we determine a panel size, uh, how we draw, how we create action and depth, and how important depth is, where we put detail, where we put emptiness, and uh, how we color something and how to do a, how to do a cover. I think that was pretty good for uh, three times one and a half hours. Tremendous. What a fantastic ending. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. But if people have questions for you, I imagine they can probably contact you via your Instagram. Yes, if you have more questions to Photoshop, I think there's a Discord for Adobe Photoshop out there. Uh, yeah, if, if you contact me, if you have some pages you want me to look over, uh, that'd be great. Uh, maybe you can send them to me and then we can talk about what, what, what interests you, what do you want to know. And maybe I can use it on an upcoming Adobe Live Masterclass to, because talking about this, giving feedback to actual artists, doing the work, having the passion, putting the time in. Yeah, that's one of the greatest joys I have. And it's, uh, yeah, it's great fun. Wonderful. It was masterful. I wish I had this masterclass when I started working in comics because I've learned a ton from this and you've laid out a lot of things that are really um, like really significant to being able to produce comics. So what a, what a lucky audience <laughs> we have. And I really hope that everyone in the audience will be inspired by this to make your own comics. And people are, people are being very positive in the chat. We've got comments like, uh, uh, Brooke says, Klaus is amazing. John Charles says, thank you for these sessions. It's been amazing. Sean, Klaus is the best. Uma Korn, thank you, Klaus and Molly and Tim. This has been great. I have to go back and watch the minutes I missed. Uh, just the absolute outpouring of, of praise for this session. And another thing that's quite fun for everybody, there's some comics that have been suggested during the stream. We've seen some of the comics that Klaus has worked on. It's actually free comic book day this Saturday. So if you need an excuse to go to a comic shop, this weekend is a pretty good excuse. You should go to your local comic shop and try to find some of these books and some of the comics that Klaus has worked on and pick up some free comics while you're at it as well. That's a great tip. That's wrapping up really. Now you put tied a little bow on it to wrap it up like this with a gift for the audience. I have to go on Saturday and grab some free comic books from my local comic book shop and answer them. Yeah, I'm going to do the same. So wonderful. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much, Klaus, for sharing all of this knowledge. And uh, yeah, this has been Bring Your Own Hero. Thanks for coming, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.